This will either offend you or save you. <laughs> it's Don Friel, boing, and I with my levitational power. So if you're here today and you thought, I can't be forgiven, I'm too bad of a sinner, you don't know how good of a savior Jesus is. No matter who you are, no matter what you have done, we're sinned and abound. Grace abounds that much more. And welcome to Wretched. My name is Todd Friel. I am your host, the wretch the song refers to. Sorry, I was a little bit late. You see, right before the program began, I got hit by a semi truck. Can you believe it? Your answer is no. You show no evidence of being mowed down by a semi truck. If you were, you'd look a little different. Maybe just the tie might be just at least a little bit crooked. No evidence? I'm not buying your tail. What does that have to do with the price of tea in Texas? Sorry, CDO. I don't have OCD. I've got it so bad it's actually CDO. What does this little analogy have to do with you and your church? Unfortunately, a lot. You see, Jesus promised that inside of the church there would be wheat and tares together. In other words, false converts and true converts. And these days in evangelical Christianity, if you look at any of the polls that ask people about their beliefs and their behavior, I, I think the proof is in the statistics that point toward a lot of tares, people that do not have evidence of the new birth. This is pandemic in evangelical Christianity. And we are to be about the business of starting by examining ourselves to see if we're in the truth, and then lovingly with one another, not be nitpicky fruit inspectors, but seeing if there is fruit in somebody's life. You got rotten fruit, you got a rotten root. Dr. Steve Lawson, when he started at a new church, he couldn't help but notice, hmm, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of evidence of the new birth. And so he set about a course to make sure that nobody in his congregation was a false convert. I was asked at my table, you know, what would I preach uh, to bring church members to Christ? Um, and, and, that's, and I said the last thing I would preach would be John 3.16. Uh, that, that just lulls everyone in the building to sleep. Um, I, I would preach the Lordship of Christ. I would preach repentance. Um, I would preach the new birth. I would preach the necessary evidence of the new birth. Um, I would preach the sovereignty of God and salvation to the extent that I could push that. I would do everything that I could to blow a trumpet in Zion and to awaken those who are asleep. Are you, are you sure this tie is straight? Dr. Steve Lawson, he understands that the new birth isn't uh, ho-hum. Dare I say being born again is perhaps more traumatic than being hit by a semi. <laughs> you get hit by the law of God. You become undone. Then you hear the good news that Jesus is willing to save you. It should be a radical experience. Am I talking about ecstatic? You got to fall down. You've got to weep buckets of tears for three weeks. Okay, I did, but you don't, you don't have to be doing those things. It doesn't need to be this public demonstration of sackcloth and ashes, but the new birth is radical. When a dead man is made alive in Christ, an individual should notice some changes, and that is precisely what John was after when he wrote the first John epistle. When I was at my previous church, it's not a, it's not a county church, but it was a, it was a long-standing church, 100 years old. Um, when I preached 1 John and the necessary evidences of the new birth, it rocked the planet. 
for good and for worse. <laughs> <laughs> yes, first John. You can count 9, 10, 11, 12, depending on how you want to order them, but first John is the examination book. John wants to make sure that you, your congregation, are not filled with tares, with rotten fish, with unwise virgins, so he gives us what I've compiled together. Steve came up with nine. I've come up with a 10-point test that will help us to examine ourselves to see if we have experienced the new birth. If you do not see this evidence in your life, you are not saved, you are self-deceived, you have never been born again. And I mean across the board, it's not three out of these nine. It's not a multiple choice. All nine of these will be evident and present in your life if you are born of God, if you know God. And if not, you're going to hell. As subtle as a napalm bomb, Dr. Steve Lawson very definitively declaring, if you don't exhibit all of the fruit that is described inside of 1 John, you're going to hell. Might I add simply one caveat to that? It could be that somebody who truly is saved hears one of these 10 points defined in John and says, yikes, I didn't know. I, I had no idea. Now I realize it. And you get on it. That could happen as we take this 10-point test, which we'll do next on Wretched. How can anyone know God unless he reveals himself? If God did not speak, religion would be nothing more than man's best guess. But God has revealed himself in creation, in the Bible, and in the person of Jesus Christ. We can know God, and we can be brought into right standing with him. But enough about me encouraging you to support the Masters Academy International. Take it from Phil Johnson. I love the Masters Academy International. I've been to several of their schools in various parts of the world, and I love the way they train national workers efficiently, inexpensively, send them back out to proclaim the gospel. It's, in my view, the, the smartest way to do missions work. Small investment, massive impact. Wretched.org slash pastor. Welcome back to Wretched. Evidence of the new birth should be evident to everyone, including ourselves. And that is why there is a book in the Bible dedicated for us to use to examine ourselves to see if we're in the truth. There is a necessary evidence of, of the new birth. And that's why 1 John is written, uh, that you may know that you have eternal life. And there's something worse than not having the assurance of your salvation What's worse is to have a false assurance of no salvation. And so you just have to shake people loose uh, from their dead testimony, from their dead religion, and, and you just have to, to, to be relentless with it. You have to paint things in black and white. Let's start painting, shall we? The 10-point test from 1 John. Number one from 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light, please notice, we're going to see that if word a lot. If this, then that. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, here it is, then we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. Saved, then you like fellowship. What is that exactly? Does it mean having some people over from church on a Sunday afternoon to watch a football game? Well, that's fine if you want to do that, but that's not fellowship. Fellowship is having Jesus Christ in the center of our conversation and our thoughts because we are in him and he is the chief priority of everybody in the room and we enjoy spending time with fellow believers more than we do with the pagans. I'm not saying you don't have pagan friends, but you prefer to spend that quality time with fellow believers in fellowship. Do you bear that fruit? Here's number two from 1 John 1, 8. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If this, then that. If we say we have no sin, you're not saved. Does that mean a person can simply 
Yeah, you know, I made some mistakes. There's been some boo-boos and hiccups in my life. Is that what John is after? Not even close. This is more like a Nineveh response. Ugh, I just want to throw dirt on my animals. I'm disgusted by my sin. I am like Paul. I want to do good, but I don't do it. The things that I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, those are the very things that I do. Who will save me from this body of death? That's what John is after. May I ask you, what is your attitude toward your sin? Have you ever been appalled at yourself? Have you ever, dare I say, been disgusted with the things that you do and think? This is not to trash talk you. This is to help you see what John wants you to see. A true Christian, one who is walking in the truth, begins by recognizing I am more than just a bit messed up. I am totally depraved. Do you understand that about yourself? Test number three. 1 John 2, 3, by this we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments, question number one, do you know the commandments? And I'm not talking about the Big Ten. I'm talking about all of God's commandments, standards, and precepts. The true Christian does. Second question, are you striving to keep those laws? We're Protestants. We recognize that when we are born again, we are totally justified, declared from heaven, totally forgiven, past, present, future sins, as far as the East is from the West. We are justified. So we do not keep the commandments to gain God's approval. Thankfully, Jesus did that for us. Then, then, after we recognize my good works are not pleasing to God, I would rather climb to heaven on a rope of sand than try to work my way there because I absolutely can't. But Jesus could, and he did, and he credits all of that to me. Now I desire to keep his commandments. I want to be obedient. Do you hear the difference? Many are confused about this. They think that, okay, well, yeah, okay, God, God forgave me, but I got to keep doing stuff so that his face will shine upon me. It's not the way it works. You are totally forgiven. And because of that wonderful good news, that serves as our motivation to be obedient, recognizing we can't please God any more than he is already pleased because he's totally pleased with Christ and we are in him. May I ask you, do you know the commandments? Are you keeping the commandments, understanding that you do not have to do things to earn salvation or to keep yourself in God's favor any more than a son who would approach a father and say, Dad, I'm going to mow the lawn. Can I still be your son? That's ridiculous, and so it is for the Christian. We are in Christ. We can go nowhere, and because of that, we want to get busy obeying the commandments. Test number four. First John 2.15, do not love the world nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. What is the world? Is it this chair or this table? And no, this is, it's a part of the world. But John is talking about the world system, the, the love of things as idols or believing false systems or following lies because it allows you to live licentiously. If we love that stuff, if we find more joy in the creation than we do in the creator, we are not in Christ. How are you doing? I'm leaving some marks, possibly. Remember the caveat. I don't want anybody to fall into despair. Remember the caveat. Maybe you, you, you haven't heard one of these four things. Then I would ask you, what's your response to that? Hmm? If it's like, you know, whatever, skinny guy, he's just being a little bit nitpicky, that's a big problem. But if you see one of these 10-point tests and recognize, oh, no, I haven't been doing that, that is the very good sign that you are indeed saved. We will continue with our 10-point test next on Wretched.
Important dates in Christian history. 64 AD, after fire ravages Rome, Emperor Nero blames Christians and unleashes the first state-sanctioned persecution of Christians. Roman persecution would continue for 250 years until Emperor Constantine officially recognized and defended Christianity. We know. It sounds terrible, but it's not going to stop until you go to wretched.org. We have thousands of hours of Wretched TV and radio. The Wretched Store has biblical resources ranging from apologetics to parenting. It's not going to stop, like ever. When Christian women are persecuted overseas for their faith, they are attacked, raped, forced to divorce, or give up custody of their children. Men experience economic harassment, imprisonment, forced military service, or they're just beat to death. Bible League International would like to bring them a Bible. Would you join them for just $5? You can bring a Bible to the persecuted church at wretched.org slash Bible. Welcome back to Wretched. Prepare to experience what Dr. Steve Lawson's congregation experienced, a 10-point test from 1 John to potentially startle you out of your slumber, to wake you up to understanding when a man is born again, it's as radical as being born. 1 John, 10 points, 10 questions asking you, are you in the truth? Let's keep taking our test, shall we? This is number five. Anyone who denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. This would fall under the banner of Christology. Theology is important. Understanding who Jesus Christ is rightly is the difference between heaven and hell. The early church councils, they wrangled with this and they made it very clear if we do not understand the Trinity rightly, if we do not understand the nature of Jesus Christ rightly, you have no place in the kingdom. Jesus himself labored over this point with the Pharisees in the marketplace, John 5, really through 11. If you don't believe in me, you don't have the Father. Theology is important. Do you understand that Jesus Christ is 100% God, 100% math, man? That's not bad arithmetic. That's good theology, and it's the difference between an eternity with God and damnation. Test number six, 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He, Jesus, appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. Do you long for the return of Jesus Christ? Do you hope that He is going to come back today to take his bride gathered together to the place that he has prepared for us. We live on this planet because God has left us here with work to do, which means, by the way, if you're not working for expanding the kingdom, uh, then you're not being an obedient servant. If you happen to be older, that should be a word of comfort to you. If you are, say, in a nursing home, an assisted care facility, and you're thinking, I just want to be done. There's nothing for me to do here. Oh, yes, there is. He has assigned work for us to do. So don't stop working for the king until he calls you home. Until that time, we should be looking longing. We should watch the reports on the news and not just be disgusted, but call out, come Lord Jesus, come. That is a sign that you are in the faith. Test number seven. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. This is not to suggest that Christians don't sin. We do sin, but do you see this language? Practices sin. That means if you do that, you are waking up in the morning, 
Ooh, have I got plans to sin tonight? And you spend your day dreaming about what you're going to do at night. You're practicing sin day after day. You repeat the cycle. John, the apostle of love says you're of the devil. Please note, Christians fall into sin, but they do not dive and swim and practice sin. Test number eight. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. You say, wait, didn't you cover that with the fellowship with the brethren business? No, this is actually taking the idea of fellowship and putting it on steroids. Not only do we like hanging with fellow believers, talking about the Lord, we love them. And it shows we serve one another, we help one another, we give to one another, we pray for one another. In other words, we do all the one another's, not because we're just, do it, do it, just be obedient, but because we love the brethren. How do you get that kind of love? It isn't because they're so lovable. It is because they, like you, are in Christ. Wow, God has saved us, and we're going to be spending eternity together. I love you more than pagans. Here's a test for you. Do you love fellow believers more than you love unbelieving family members? Test number nine. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God it does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. If you love to hear good teaching, you love preaching, longer the sermon the better, the deeper the better, then, then you're in Christ. If you don't like hearing from God through the proclamation of his word, that's an indicator you're not in Christ. Test number 10. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Again, I think there's a Christological element in this, but I think John is after even more. Do you blush? Do you run from speaking when you know that you should? You are like Jonah. He's told you to speak, but you keep holding it in. That is a bad sign. If the reason for it is, well, I'm kind of embarrassed about this. I recognize evangelism. It's an irksome task. It's not easy, and we need to get trained. We can practice, and we can get better at it. But if you fear telling anybody about Jesus because, well, I don't want them to think I'm one of those Jesus crackpots, that's a sign that you are not saved. So, how did you do? I know what you're asking. What's the curve? We'll tackle that in our surprise next on Wretched. A vital part of biblical hermeneutics is an understanding of genre. One genre we find in Scripture is an epistle. Epistles are letters written to the church at large or to a specific church which contain doctrine and practical application. God uses first century correspondence to deliver His timeless truth. Hearing the heartbeat made me cry and it was certain that I was going to keep my baby forever. And I cannot imagine my life without my happy, lovely, joyful, smart baby, and I'm so grateful. Another ultrasound, another saved baby. For just $28, you could save the life of a child by providing a free ultrasound through preborn.org. How many babies could you save? Preborn.org slash wretched. Would you please consider becoming a gospel partner? We cannot do anything wretched without the support of God's people. And so I would like to invite you to consider, Todd quit talking to me like Al Gore, becoming a gospel partner. 
If you have already planned your giving for church, excellent, the local church comes first. But if you have the ability to give more to a ministry that is trying to preach the gospel to as many people as possible, would you please consider becoming a gospel partner so we can keep doing that very thing? You can do that at wretched.org slash donate. Yes, these kids are having a good time, but this is about a lot more than just dancing and singing. This is about the gospel. You're seeing a Tomorrow Club in action. Kids coming to hear the gospel be loved on by the team leaders. They're getting saved and they're bringing the gospel home to mom and dad. This is about a lot more than just fun. Would you please support your own Tomorrow Club at tomorrowclubs.org slash wretched. Welcome back to a wretched surprise. Dr. Steve Lawson throwing rocks into a crowd. The one that screams is the one that got hit. What caused that screaming? First John, a 10 point test to see if you are in the truth. He preached through that book and many people and perhaps even you now haven't taken that 10 point test are feeling a bit wounded, what is the correct response? People like that usually don't walk the aisle at the end of the service. I mean, Spurgeon said the wounded deer wants to withdraw to the thickets and lick its wounds in private rather than be paraded forward in front of a TV camera. Um, and so there was week after week after week after week after week after week after week just nonstop that knock on my, my office door when the service is over, and can I talk to you? And my office became like the, the birthing room at the hospital, and I would just say, have a seat, and the, the cushion is still creased from the last person that was, you know, sat there, and the box of Kleenex right there, and, and people just under the, a sense of desperation, and that's the way it was in Acts 2. They, they interrupted Peter's sermon, and the sinners gave the invitation. What must we do to be saved? There is a sense of desperation. Having taken the 10 point test, do you feel desperate? You're not. Desperate is to be without hope. Desperate is to recognize I'm in really big trouble here and there is no rescue for me. The good news of the gospel is you should feel desperate, but you should also know that you're not because you have a rescuer, you have a redeemer, you have a savior, and his name is Jesus Christ. If you have been alerted to the state of your salvation and now you're in a panic, you don't have to be. Call out to God, repent, put your trust in Jesus Christ and you will be adopted into his family totally and forever. Let's see who won something, shall we? Congrats to Dan Dangle. Herman who, would you like to win? Visit wretched.org, subscribe to the free Wretched newsletter. And until tomorrow, Go serve your king. Thank you for spending time with Wretched, and thank you for your tax-deductible financial support that allows us to preach the amazing gospel. Wretched, amazing grace.